So uh, welcome to the panel on lab spaces and lab space design. So we've uh, put together a panel here to talk about some of the issues associated with building a lab or operating a lab or even potentially operating without a lab. Um, all the issues and concerns that, that we have noticed in our experience from, from working at various stages of this lab development process. Um, we're going to talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll take questions after that. Um, if we finish early, we'll take more questions. Um, but Sean was very diligent in filling out this. Uh, in, in case you guys haven't noticed, I am not Sean Stafford. Um, Sean is un unfortunately unable to be here today because of a family, uh, a family issue. Um, so I'll be filling in his very large shoes as best I can. So, Okay, so uh, I think the first question we want to address here, the first thing we want to address here is just a quick personal introduction for everybody, who we are, what we do. So uh, I'll go ahead and start. I'm, I'm, I'm Dr. Adam Greenwood Erickson. Uh, I am a course director at Full Sail University. And I also work in the Full Sail User Experience Lab. Um, the lab is a place where we bring in projects from the industry, from sort of commercial games from the industry, and have our students test them to get experience in uh, game user re various aspects of game user research. Um, one of the things I'm interested in talking about here is, uh, is figuring out how other people have solved some of the issues we've faced uh, in setting up a lab. We've gone the whole sweep from sort of guerrilla testing with a laptop and, you know, and a, and a, and a, a, a chair that we dragged around um, all the way up through a, like a converted office space and finally to a, a really nice, new, shiny lab facility. So um, and I'll try to, I want to share my insights from that along the way and also get a sense of what other people have experienced. So. My name's uh, Ben Lyle. I'm currently at Amazon. Uh, before that, I was at Warner Brothers Games. And I built a handful of labs, both with no budget or little budget, never with a lot of budget. So most of my stuff is temporary or um, uh, uh, semi-permanent, I guess the easiest way to put it. Um, yeah, so that's it. Right. Hello, I'm Seb Long from Player Research uh, in Brighton. Uh, we are a five-man consultancy, uh, mo working mostly at the moment on one-to-one, -one, uh, unmoderated and moderated playtesting. I'm in the process of designing uh, a medium budget, let's say, playtesting lab. Uh, so I've done help design labs at a very low budget and moving up to the medium. Uh, so you're looking forward to learning with you guys as much as possible about the medium budget, but also hopefully sharing some stuff about uh, AV and tech. That's really where I come in. I've spent a lot of time learning about uh, various formats and different you know, cables and whatnot, the different technical uh, tools that are available to you are on all sorts of budgets. Hi, I'm Nana Wallace, and I'm the uh, director of the User Experience Research Lab here at Sony. And um, let's see, we our, our play testing for us has started at the production level at the development team. So we've had um, everything from uh, converted co conference room, hotel rooms, um, things schlepped in, all the way up to of building a facility in the middle of our development studio with the pluses and minuses of doing that all the way to what you see today is kind of our ultimate. And this, this lab's been up and running for about two years. So one of the things that I look forward to hearing are other people's stories. I mean, we've learned our successes and failures in the design choices that we made and some of the things that we did. And we, we had a pretty healthy budget because we were able to build this out when Sony moved to this campus. So everything about this campus was a build from scratch. Um, so we were able to take advantage of that. We were just given some floor space and said, go. Pretty, feeling pretty lucky. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, let's jump right in here. The, the first uh, topic I think we're going to get to uh, is this notion of whatever the top you know, three or four issues that each of us encountered uh, when we were going through this. So uh, for me, you know, one of the first things that, that we ran into when we were designing a lab was that uh, and we learned this when we were operating out of a single converted office space, is that you, it really makes a lot of sense to have separate facilities for play tests and usability studies. You can double them up, um, but there's actually a huge amount of, of uh, we found that there's a lot of synergy between having play tests and usability tests going on simultaneously. Um, it allows you to, to recruit lots of the same kinds of people. Um, you can get some insight you know, across populations. But also, if you have manpower on site, play tests are pretty low overhead in terms of of what somebody's, somebody's time cons uh, consumption is. It's basically setting people up, sitting them down, monitoring them, and then bringing them back out again, at least the way that we do it. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense to have something else going on while that play test is happening. So we can set up a, a room full of play testers. In our current facility, we can run 24 simultaneously. So you'd set up a room full of play testers, and then you can go run a study, come back uh, at, at the end of the usability study, um, you know, move the play testers around if you need to, bring in a new set, move a new set out. Um, or you can have just one person, one of your staff, handling all the playtest issues and then supporting 
other tests. So we found that's something that, that has some real value to it, having, having those separated facilities so we can do uh, both of those simultaneously. Another big thing for us has been tech support. Um, we have found that if, you, if, you can, if someone can build it, uh, someone can break it, and they'll usually do it at the worst possible moment. And if you, if, if this will, I'll talk about this later on when I talk about like the choice of technology, but uh, some of the tech that, that goes into really advanced and, and, and um, flexible labs is stuff that is very hard to fix when it breaks. Um, you know, these sort of integrated digital data streaming solutions that are really, really cool and also really, really prone to failure and very hard to troubleshoot. So that's something that I would, I would strongly encourage if you're building a lab and using vendors, get some sort of agreement in the contract to support it for a certain period of time, I would suggest at least a year. Uh, because inevitably stuff will go wrong uh, throughout that time period, and you want to have the, someone on the hook to fix it. Uh, most of my suggestions are very practical suggestions. Um, <laughs> bathrooms, put them really close. Uh, if, if at all, hidden behind, sec or not behind, but through security, so you don't have to pass back through security again if you're uh, dealing in a secure facility kind of like this. Uh, just it cuts down on staffing. So if you have to have, to have, have an extra person who is their main role is running people to and from the bathroom, it becomes really costly and ridiculous. Um, power. Make sure that there's enough power circuits in any lab that you build. Make sure if they blow, you know where to go reset them. You have access to be able to re go reset them. Um, air conditioning. It gets really hot in labs. Uh, usually you have a PC another PC, console, another console, and then 16 of those. And so, and then bodies, and then 16 bodies. I mean, it just depends, it just multiplies and it gets really, really hot and smelly. Um, snacks, just have them all over the place. Sometimes you can get people through lunch without actually having to feed them if they, uh, <laughs> you know, if they have snacks. If it's a six hour play test that happens to run over lunch, instead of a you know a full day where you would feed them. But if you can get away with an extra half hour of their playing time and they don't aren't gonna faint, you know, it, it might be worth it for you. Um, and parking. Uh, parking is a pain in the ass. Especially if you're in a city um, and in a building where uh, they've really carefully allocated parking and you just happen to exist in this building now randomly before the after they've allocated this parking around. Um, see if you can find deals with parking lots around you that you can validate for them. So that's it. I guess as an extension to, uh, to parking, as an external consultancy, we're also dealing with a lot of developers traveling to us. So we're not, we're not on the premises of any developer. Uh, so being close to a hotel, if you, if you have the luxury of choosing where you are in a city, um, for us, choosing to be close to hotels has been really important to allow just to remove friction points for the developers to come down and see the tests. It's so important as an external consultancy for developers to come and see the test in action, which is less common than you'd think, actually. Uh, removing those friction points, being close to train station, close to the buses, having a hotel nearby that you can recommend is really, really important. Uh, it's, been, it's been okay for us in the center of Brighton. We've got lots of hotels and things. Uh, so that's luckily not been too much of an issue. Uh, speaking of being in Brighton, uh, we're right by the sea. Uh, with lots of seagulls, um, which we can't really avoid, but they're very noisy. Uh, actually, they make a lot of noise through the windows. Something we could have avoided ha had we noticed uh, our first office we moved to in Brighton. Uh, we didn't know at the time when we were visiting the office to check it out, but was actually on the main route out of town for the emergency services. So every you know, once an hour, screaming sirens going by. Uh, you know, luckily it was only for a temporary home for us. Uh, but that was, you know, we were kicking ourselves when we realized the mistake we'd made. So yeah, check it. being by a main road helps, but there are definite downsides to that too. Um, yeah. Uh, cable routing, um, I guess maybe less of a concern, I'm not sure, but uh, cables take up much more room than you think. So make sure you're, if you're design, able to design the inside of a space, like Nana has, um, you know, allocate enough room for cables. Ethernets and stuff really start to build up if you, you know, you've got all these computers you're having to run Ethernet to and so forth. Uh, so yeah, allocate that. Make sure there's room in, in the designs you're putting forward. Or space, ideally, spaces in the walls if you've got the luxury enough to, to build your own space. All right. So a lot of the issues that, that, that we have a lot of the same common issues. So playing off of what, building off of what other, these others had talked about, in addition to like the participant flow, the same issues with bathroom, parking, eating, 
uh, exists for your observers too. If you are bringing your teams in, your teams are actually in the space watching. We like to bring our dev teams here to sit because even though there's a piece of glass separating them, the, the discomfort that they feel, the empathy that they feel for their, the, 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 the participants is, is real. There's a ton of value in them watching somebody just on the other side of the glass struggling. To, to play certain things with their games. So we bring a lot of people here, but the same issues. It gets hot in there. They bring a lot of equipment. Um, they need to eat. And, and um, uh, some other things that we think about is um, soundproofing. So soundproofing is a big deal, playing off what you said. We um, learned a lot based on our, our team in London had built a facility first. We went over there, spent a lot of time working with them, and they were super gracious in, in helping us think through different things and telling us what things that they would have done differently. And the, one of the big things was definitely soundproofing. Um, soundproofing to make sure that your um, observers in the back room could speak freely, could talk. It could be a productive. Bringing those people together in that, that closed environment is often um, s incredibly valuable for them to, to have their conversations. So enabling them to have the conversations, enabling them to laugh when they see something really funny without disturbing the participants. Because if anybody hears, uh, if any of the participants hear people in the back room, that really just breaks breaks and it makes them self-conscious. So soundproofing so that we can have uh, teams in the back be able to speak, walk around, be free back there. Um, and so the soundproofing goes into, then that plays into things like we took into consideration full height walls. These are fake ceilings. We had to build walls all the way to the ceiling. We double sheet rocked uh, things. We have a sound lab here. So we use a lot of the techniques um, that our sound labs use to isolate. Um, we couldn't do much with the, the floor. We are on, a, on the first floor, so that helps. But again, you know, the same thing um, with airplanes come overhead, so we have double pane glass, we use uh, different densities of glass, we use double sheet rock, we use some quiet rock in different places for sound absorbing. Um, and, um, and for your duct work, when you're actually cable routing, noise will travel up through and then through, they'll follow the cable channel. So there was a lot of soundproofing that needed to be done in the cable routing. Also with the uh, HVAC systems, all of the air conditioning, both the uptake and the air conditioning that makes a ton of noise and it also can carry. So there was a lot of soundproofing that was done there. So I'm going to beat on the soundproofing. Um, what else? And then, you know, similar to what you were saying about the research technology, I think it's really important maintainability and reliability. Because if something goes down, the cost of losing one data point or two data points or three data points is really, really expensive. So you want it to be able to recover yourself. You want reliability. You want redundancy. And those are things that were super important in the consideration in when we were building. Makes sense. So, so uh, we've all recently gone through the process to, to various degrees of designing a lab. So uh, one thing that I think would be helpful is for us to go ahead and talk a little bit about you know, it's not necessarily what we did, but what we wish we'd done uh, when we were designing the lab. What, what, what sort of process uh, would, would we or, or have we followed? Um, in our case, I felt like the physical layout piece, which is what you sort of immediately think of as being the most important point, actually was not that difficult. Um, you know, as long as you understand what's supposed to happen, you're supposed to have observation areas where you can see people in test areas, you want to separate the test areas, that part takes care of itself pretty easily. Um, what I found being really uh, sort of a challenge is, uh, and, and Nana referred to this a minute ago, is participant flow. When you bring somebody in, where do, they, where do they come in? Where do they sit? Where do you put their stuff? How do you get them from one point to another without them seeing things they shouldn't see or hearing things they shouldn't hear or disturbing somebody else doing a test? Um, those are things that make a ton of sense to think about before you build the facility as opposed to what we did, which is build it and then afterwards try to figure it all out. Um, so that's really important. Also, uh, you know, how you get your data around. Moving data around the facility is, is a really big deal. We have this very cool, very high-tech, very gee whiz integrated audio and video data streaming system that can push a signal from any system in the building to any screen. And it's, it's all very wonderful, except when it doesn't work. Um, because when it doesn't work, we can't fix it. And we have to sort of reset everything and try over again. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's a, there's a reliability issue. Uh, Sean, who I'm pretending to be here today, uh, would not agree with me. 
on this probably. But if I could do it all over again, I, I would have put a switch, like a physical switchboard in and literally had plugs that I was moving in and out. Um, because that's something that anybody can fix. I don't have to get the right person to do it. I could send any random graduate student, no offense guys, um, to the back to plug that thing in and I can be pretty sure it'll, it'll be right. Um, so thinking about how you move data, where that data, you know, where that data goes, data go, data go, sorry, got my plurals wrong. Um, moving, moving data around in, in, in successful ways as well as moving participants around is, is a big deal and that's something you want to spend a lot of time thinking about before you build the facility. Um, most most of the labs I've built have been in places that uh, something else existed there before we didn't build a new building in order to get there. So usually when that happens, I, I attach myself to my facilities manager and I make sure that I talk with them as often as possible because they usually know things and will tell you things before uh, maybe publicly known about spaces in the building that are going to be open, things that you could possibly use, things that are going to move around. So um, I make a point of doing that if, if at all possible. Um, and also when, when looking to design a lab, usually I build out about th three budgets for it. And the smallest one is the one I actually want to use and the upper two are the ones that I'm fine letting go if at all possible. And so, and then just present those and all the uh, reasons for and against. Yeah, I think just, I guess, building on just general tips for, for lab design, uh, lots and lots of storage is really important. I think the more equipment you have, it means the more spares you need to have for, for everything. Uh, you end up having to store a lot of stuff. So if you're lucky enough to design your own space or if you're just accommodating a space that exists already, make sure you're allocating enough uh, you know, physical space for shelves and storage and whatnot. Um, the mistake I made uh, in our newest office that we're fitting out now is not considering the really unusual power requirements. These PTZ cameras, like the ones mounted on the back wall up there, um, are, are much better if you've got power near the ceiling and not power near the floor, uh, such that you can trail cables around. So I'm kicking myself for not, not thinking of that. So think about the unusual power requirements that you might be having in some of these rooms. Uh, where your electronics going to be, it helps to have a full plan. I mean, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so I've, I've, you know, I know exactly where my cameras are going to be, despite the fact this office isn't fully built yet. Uh, but consider where these strange power requirements might end up being. Um, generally speaking, uh, I don't know, maybe it depends on what kind of work you're doing in the rooms, but I'd say wall space is really vital. I think in here that really demonstrates it with these huge whiteboards on the wall. Um, giving up free space for the walls and, and generating a lot of open wall space for collaborative working, I think, is, is super important and not something to be, uh, to be forgotten. Uh, yeah, and, and just generally thinking about flexible space, uh, I, not putting any of your rooms together such that they can't be uh, brought apart or, or brought broken down for different types of studies. You've no idea, generally speaking, especially as an external consultancy, what kind of work you're going to be doing, what kind of crazy, loopy stuff you're going to be asked to do. So ideally, don't mount your TVs to the walls. Don't fix your room in a certain orientation. Um, you don't have much choice with these PTZs because they, I guess they have to be mounted to the wall. Uh, but ideally, have them across the room such that they can be as flexible as possible. And you can open yourself up to running different kinds of studies for all sorts of loopy things that you're going to be asked to do as, as games user researchers. Um, perfect. So for the design considerations, I mean, the way we went about to designing a lab, the first thing we did really was go look at everybody else's. We went and looked at everything and we talked to everybody that we could. Um, again, you know, like I mentioned, we had a, a, an office in London and had really built a wonderful facility and we're working through it. We learned a ton from them. Um, we learned a lot and we built a lot of our base of our designs uh, from what they had done. Then really what we did we looked at other places, talked to other researchers, and we actually did sort of a needs assessment on ourselves. We, we kind of tested ourselves. What are the things that we want to do? What kind of research are we going to run? What kind of research do we want to run? What research do we think we might run someday? And then we have this crazy thing where we have hardware and all these random um, cameras and lights and so we talked to our R&D team. What are the things that you guys are interested in doing? What do you think you might want to test? And so we took all of those things and tried to work them into a design. And then we looked at our space uh, requirements, our space constraints. And then we made a few designs. And then we really took and we, we um, played through a number of scenarios on our space that we designed. And that was things like, camera, can I see everything? If I hold this camera in this corner, what can I see? 
and we would hold them in place and look and we considered the placement of everything and the same as you we have a bunch of orientation I don't know how many of you looked at our lab spaces like our living room we actually located against a window because we have um, cameras and there are um, we have um, IR light issues and those are some things that we need to be able to test so we need to be able to open the windows we also need to be able to close them, make them completely dark. We need to be able to have light coming from the back, from the side, from the front. And so our room orientation, if you look at the way we've, we've, we have a complement of connections in all four areas. So we can take and spin the room. We don't mount our TVs. Again, that's why it's on furniture. Um, but we look at all of these things and we think, what could we do? What would we want to do? And can we do those things um, in this space? And again, like Ben was saying, we had, we had different budgets. And we, we asked for the best and negotiated down to the men. And when we went down to the men, we knew exactly what we were giving up. We knew exactly what we were giving up. Um, and, but what we did is we built in the flexibility to ultimately get those things back. Mm -hmm. So conduits that were large enough. Power, signi significant amounts of power in the ceiling. So give us the flexibility. So that's what we really did. Really look at everybody else's. Talk to them. What do you want to do? What might you want to do? Um, build those. And again, reliability. I can't stress reliability and simplicity enough. Don't overcomplicate it. Know what you need to do. Keep it simple. Keep it reliable. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, there's a saying, you know, location, location, location are three most important things in real estate. And to some degree, that's also true with user testing. You know, where your facility is and, and, and what access points you have makes a big difference potentially in the day-to-day -day operations. So uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about how, about how that's, uh, that's affected. Um, in our case, you know, we're, we're located on a university campus, and that has some major advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages, of course, is that we have ready access to subjects that are generally sort of the, the core test population for most of the games that we test. Um, and so, whereas it actually allows us to use very different recruitment procedures because what we primarily do is bring in lots of potential testers, screen them, and then essentially throw the fish that we don't want back, uh, as opposed to having to schedule them in advance and, and get really sophisticated in the front end. Um, that's a capability we probably really only have because we're lucky enough to be surrounded at any given moment by thousands of people who are potential target demographics. Um, but that has changed recently. We've moved, we, our old lab location, while it was rather small, um, was right in the middle of the heart of campus and people walked by at a rate of 20 or 30 a minute. Um, and so we could literally just sort of reach out and pluck people out and we had, a, we had a sign that we'd roll out into the hallway that said, you know, user testing, you know, please inquire. And we'd stick it out and about 10 minutes later we'd usually have enough, we'd pop it back <laughs> in. Um, so, uh, and you know, we, so we'd bring them in, we'd screen them, and some of them would meet requirements, some of them wouldn't. But um, that we no longer have that capability. We can still do it. We just actually kept that room just so we can shove the sign out. But now we have to walk them around campus a little bit to get to the new spot. Um, so in terms of recruitment, that can be an issue if that's how you're approaching it. If you're not, though, um, there are definite issues with parking in terms of, and it's not just whether there's space available, it's whether there's space that they can find. So we have a parking lot that we can use when we bring Christmas in from off campus. It's a great parking lot, but there's no, there's no like, like a paved path from one point to the other. They have to walk around this little drowning hazard, we call it. It's like this, it's Florida, right? So we got, we got lots of water and lots of alligators. And uh, so like how you get from point A to point B is potentially a matter of life and death when you're walking. Um, <laughs> so we actually have to have like, there's like a little area that, that they have to cut, sort of cut through. And some people are kind of scared to walk through this space. So there's a sidewalk route that we have to take them on sometimes. And so, uh, so those things, you know, we didn't think about it. There was a parking area in front of us, but we didn't realize that it had ever been allocated to something else. I think Seb brought that up, and, um, and so did Ben. And so that's, that's something that, that, that definitely comes up. Um, the, the advantage of being farther away from a core recruitment area like that uh, is that it's quieter. And we used to have problems once in a while where um, there were, you know, a bunch of students would decide to have a little impromptu discussion of three or four hundred people uh, right in front of our room <laughs> and uh, sometimes we had to go out and yell at them chase them off and that distracts everybody right to hey, get off my lawn so so those are my thoughts anybody else uh, yeah just reiterating like if you're working in a fa secure facility trying to place the lab outside of security trying to place it somewhere where there's reception that can maybe only deal with you or the light a light workflow, so not a lot of people walking through this area, if at all possible. 
Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's it as far as location goes. I, you know, don't be in a, the middle of a city if you can at all help it. Where I am right now, um, it's frustrating. It's hard to get to. Um, directions are hard for people to read and understand, even though you make it as easy as possible. You would think. Um, and yeah, and par just reiterate parking. If you can find a way to get parking for your participants, uh, do it if at all possible. Yeah, nothing, nothing huge to add to, uh, to those great points. Uh, considering cross-site security, I think is important if you're not lucky enough to have a campus to yourself. Um, I think we're going to, we, we may will be considering uh, filming our windows to stop, you know, make it absolutely clear that there's, you know, well, absolutely unclear, absolutely opaque, in fact. <laughs> uh, you know, that you can't see through these windows. There can be no uh, chance of people look from overlooking or overlooking us in other tower blocks, seeing through these windows and capturing any sort of information at all. I'm sure that people aren't doing that, but you know, just to be absolutely sure, um, just for, for that cross-site security, I think we're going to film our windows. Uh, so something to consider when you're, if you're lucky enough to be able to choose your own space. Uh, if not, then filming, I'm sure, is going to work great. Um, let's see, location. So pluses and minuses. Being on campus, um, it makes it really easy for us to get down to our lab. We don't have to travel very far. Um, if we have a, we're running a bunch of one-on-one -on -one sessions, we have a cancellation, we're not just stuck sitting there. We can run back up to our offices. Um, our dev teams are close. It's really easy for them. It removes a lot of excuses for why they can't come down there and participate. So being on campus has its advantages. But then it has disadvantages because you've all seen that you, most people drove by this gigantic PlayStation um, fountain out front and you check in with the gigantic P, blue P at the front desk. We can't, we try to minimize the branding, but we can't completely get away from the branding. What we do is try to make them forget as much as possible once they go through the back um, off the lobby, we try to remove as much branding as possible. Um, and inside the rooms, it's generic. Uh, we actually have video game art, video game books, but it covers everybody. So, you know, they tend to be more art books, more art, um, interesting artwork that is um, it, it, that is good for the gamers that will come and our participants. But we tend to remove it as much as humanly possible. Um, so, you know, like you guys talked to, you know. Uh, close to a density of population, mm -hmm. so it makes it easier to recruit, is important. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's it. So, uh, one thing that I've seen pop up here a lot is that we all sort of, at the end of the process, or, or maybe not Nana, she seems to have done it right, really, uh, Nana rather, but the rest of us um, have a lot of sort of, I don't want to say regrets, but things we wish we'd done a little differently, sort of best practices, lessons learned type, uh, type, type processes. Uh, for us, a couple of those were, uh, you know, one, one thing that's really important is having visual backups. We learned that one the hard way um, in our old facility, that uh, if your cameras don't work, and that's the only way you have to collect data, you're not collecting data. Um, so it's really good just, you know, sometimes, we, at one point we had decided we, we weren't actually going to do the window thing because we had all this great camera tech, and that was going to solve our problems for us. Uh, and then we had a couple situations where, you know, cameras didn't work, and we now have no data at all. Um, we're sitting in a room, and they're in a, sitting in a different room, and we have no way of communicating. Um, and we've come up with solutions. You can, you know, you can you use a conference call phone effect, and that sort of works. It's a little ghetto, but it, it does kind of work. Um, but it makes a lot of sense to have those, those visual backups. You know, if, you can, if you can afford to do it, put the, put the, the one-way mirror in, um, just so that you have that, that option. Also, you get a ton of extra information out of that type of approach that you don't necessarily get off a camera feed, even really high-resolution cameras. A lot of times, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a flat image. You lose a lot of, a lot of the, the nuance and the context of what's going on when you're observing the user. Um, it's sort of ironic, you know, when I started doing this back in the 90s, like that was the cheap solution if you couldn't afford the really nice high resolution CCTV cameras. And now that we, you know, not, now that stuff is dirt cheap, but now you, you, you worry, you know, that that's, yeah, anyway. <laughs> but I digress. Um, actually, that's a great point. Generally, having low tech backups for everything in the lab is really important. If you're using surveys or scales, anything that you can do that you could possibly do on paper or, or in a low-tech Stone Age level solution, have that available um, because you never know what's going to break. And, and most of the, you know, the, I would say at least one thing breaks per test usually. Um, it may be a si tiny thing that doesn't really matter, but something will go wrong most of the time. And having a backup ready makes, makes that a lot, work a lot better. And uh, this, I think, uh, I think uh, Ben covered this and, and maybe somebody else, but uh, you can never have enough power outlets in a test room. 
and can never have enough, enough HVAC, enough air conditioning, um, especially in Florida, because we already need a lot of air conditioning. And, um, you start getting the power requirements go up. And, and, and you know, you'd think you have, you have a full set of, of outlets in there, and you think that that's going to be enough. But once you start hooking stuff up, um, we had to have a lecture a couple months back about daisy chaining. Um, cause, because, you know, the, genuinely they needed more space. But, you know, you come back and there's a power strip plugged into a power strip. And it's, yeah, your linear fire marshal goes, ooh, not good. So yeah, so we had to have a little conversation about that. But and we even then we had double we had we had four four unit receptacles in all of our test rooms and we still ran out in some cases. So uh, there's no possibility of having too many of those. So the more the merrier on that. Yeah, that just reminded me. I almost burned the building down once. <laughs> um, by daisy chaining uh, power strips and I took out a printer that started smoking. I there. Yeah, I forgot about that until now. Uh, I really wanted to forget about that. Um, yeah, so I have don't over design here, but I don't really mean that. Um, I think don't over commit to current technology, um, if at all possible, because it, it changes. It gets not better, but m easier to use, maybe, and cheaper um, as time goes on. But also development direction changes. So if you're if you're on a team, all of a sudden the it's somewhere up above you somewhere. Um, the team decides they're they want to do something mobile now instead of you know PC based or how or whatever the example may be. And so if you've got a full lab that's you know PC based and you're forty thousand deep into computers and all of a sudden they're useless to you, um, you know do your best to find a way to reuse them <laughs> if you need to. Um, and then, yeah, power and AC. Those are the only other things that I can think of as far as best practices go. Don't burn the building down. <laughs> nice. Um, I'll try and be a bit quick because I don't know how much time we've got left. But um, waiting areas can never be big enough or numerous enough. Don't ever consider a staging area wasted space. I think they're incredibly valuable. We've got a large space where we are now, and it's still not big enough. And it's going to get even worse with more players, I think. Um, and remember, you're going to be handling a lot of cash, uh, especially if you're doing multiple person play tests. You could, if you, I don't know if you guys give cash uh, uh, for for playtests or whatever, but we do, and you, you actually accumulate quite a lot. If you're running a couple of tests a week, you know, two groups a day, 16 people per group, you, you're handling a lot. So consider those security as much as as well. Also, the players' uh, bags and whatnot. I love your see-through lockers; they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. They they're, they're <laughs> super nice. Super <laughs> jealous of those. Um, so I think, you know, as far as for us, I think everybody's pretty much covered our high points. But, you know, to echo what Ben said is not over design. Simplicity, you know, um, make it extensible, flexible, adaptable. And that, that really is the key thing. It's, it's very easy to get sucked into a very complicated design because it's really cool and it's going to be really wonderful. But when things change it makes it very hard, expensive to change. It's painful to change. So having a very good basic foundation, focus on that foundation. That would be our, one of our biggest learnings. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, speaking of expensive, uh, so when you have a budget, there are some, some techs that, uh, that you can afford that are potentially really useful. Um, for us, one of the things that, that we really liked was you know, the, the, the AV system I was complaining about a minute ago is actually incredibly cool and has all these great, great capabilities. And that's something that uh, cost us a big chunk of the budget that we put into the into the lab. Um, it allows us to do amazing stuff, like be testing data, you know, be collecting data simultaneously in several rooms, or um, have multiple distributed teams getting slightly different feeds and being able to do that stuff that stuff in real time. All great stuff, um, a capability that nothing else could fill in for. But on the other hand, it it was not a a cheap um, it was not a, a a cheap capability to to put in. Um, and uh, also, uh, when you're when you're putting when you're working on uh, on, on allocating your budget, I, I really can't stress enough that cameras, camera quality, really really critical. Cameras are, are very very important, not just for for like the, uh, for, well for documentation in, in many parts. That's, that's the biggest piece of this because you'll miss something during live data collection. Someone won't write it down. You'll miss it, or you won't be able to write it down because you don't have enough live bodies. And uh, you'll go back to the feed, and if the camera's not good enough, you won't be able to figure out what happened. So that's a great place to spend money if you have it. And then uh, we actually do a lot of physio physiological metrics. I know that's not necessarily popular with everybody. Um, we find that it has value in a lot of cases, but also uh, it's something that, because we're tr our primary product is students rather than, uh, than, than assessments or tests, 
uh, having the students trained up and able to use those is a great tool, even if they never use it, just having them know how to do it is a thing. So we sometimes push that when, even when it's not necessarily the best choice, just so that we get a chance to, to get them to practice it. Um, so all those, I think, are good uses of, if you have a lot of money lying around, that's a great way to, to spend it. <laughs> uh, I guess riffing a little bit off Ben's point and talking about um, not committing too much to future, uh, to the current tech, or at least thinking a little bit about what tech's coming in the future. Um, when dealing with a lot of video uh, outputs and video sources, uh, converting the source from HDMI or whatever it, it is currently to an, an SDI, which is a different cable type, um, is an expensive solution, but allows a load of options for different for routing. You can route, you can send signals for longer. You can composite more easily. It's a bit more um, robust. You can allowing so HDMI runs about 15, 20 meters before it starts to degrade, especially at high frame rates. Converting to SDI allows you to maybe run that for 100, 100 meters, 200 meters, a lot, lot further. So there's a huge, huge expense in that. It's, it's going to be about 250 British pounds per conversion or thereabouts. Uh, but there's the huge amount of, uh, a huge number of positives that come with that. So the topic, I guess, was expensive tech that helps. Yeah. You need to weigh up whether, whether or not converting to another source. We also got, I think your solution is uh, TV over IP is another solution that's mm -hmm. also quite expensive, but again, more robust. Yeah. Uh, you can do uh, HDMI over Cat5 as well, which allows you to run uh, long cable distances. But as soon as you're dealing with lots of sources and potentially long cable runs, you're looking at a much more expensive setup. So bear that in mind when you're designing your labs. Let's see, for expensive, I would say we, similar, we converted everything to an SDI backbone. It was much more reliable, longer runs, um, and that was an expense. Mm -hmm. So video routing, we spent a lot of money on video routing. So that was probably the thing that where we spent a good chunk of money. The rest of our tech, we did a lot of it off-the-shelf components that we, we wrapped ourselves. So. Which brings up a great point uh, on the other end. Oh. Ten minutes. Okay, cool. Uh, on the other end, it, so ten minutes... Ten minutes for questions or ten minutes before for questions. for questions? Okay. Uh, do you guys want to hit the free tech? Is that quick? Quick. Let's. I'm going to stand on my soapbox and say that OBS, Open Broadcast yeah. Software, is just m absolutely magnificent uh, for an op open source piece of software. It is just unparalleled. Uh, we've used it a lot. Um, you know, I was resistant at first to using open source, but we've used it for every playtest since, and it is magnificent. Really, really robust. It's got a great plugin system. Uh, it does, you know, it's got streaming options which are really useful for us. We've got our own private streaming stuff that Ben at the back of the room, my colleague, set up for us. Um, so, yeah, if you're looking for a, a low cost, it doesn't get lo low cost and free, but it really is it's very, very, very good indeed. Yeah, he's absolutely right. We use it, we love it, it's great stuff. Um, when you're delivering video, which sometimes we deal with, mm -hmm. um, we've tried a bunch of solutions like Hitbox and Hightail, much of that stuff. And we find that, uh, that YouTube, a private YouTube account is, is the best way to deliver video to a client for us on the cheap end mm -hmm. of the scale. Mm -hmm. That's uh, been a good uh, deal for us. One more piece of software that might be useful for you. Um, Logitech have got their own, uh, obviously they make webcams, but they have their own downloadable uh, webcam software that allows them to be panned and zoomed. Uh, so if you can't afford a really expensive camera like that one at the back, which is maybe going to set you back $2,000 or something, uh, or maybe more, I don't know, um, it's a, it's a you know, potentially cheap alternative. Get a 15 quid webcam and you can you can't pan properly but you can at least move around the image you can zoom in a little get closer to the player's hands or controllers or, or the face or, or whatever uh, and that's totally free to download from the logitech website so yeah nice piece of software excellent you guys have any last thoughts before we turn it open to questions all right well we'll take questions from the audience anything we can answer yeah so have any of you set up uh, labs for mobile testing things like um uh, I know that you've probably worked with PlayStation Vita, but anything like phones, tablets, things like that? Uh, yeah, about 80% of the stuff we do is mobile, uh, iPad, iPhone, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so um, what's the best solution for basically recording hands and things like that without making the camera intrusive to the player? Oh, uh, wow. Okay, so... And if, if you're in contact with the developers, they can put touch points onto the device, but potentially the player's going to see them because they're either on the screen I think there are solutions that will only put the touch points out the mirrored output, but that requires buy-in from the developers to put that s software in. You can't, I don't think you can do it yourself. Um, otherwise, PTT cameras like the ones at the back um, allow you to pan and tilt and uh, move around the scene, which allows you to move potentially around players that are s sitting in oppositions or what have you. Um, as I said, they're quite expensive. Maybe that Logitech solution is, is one that's useful for you. Um, but broadly speaking, you've got no choice except to ask the player to sit back against the back of the sofa, uh, thereby keeping the, uh, you know, the iPad open and having a camera up above them somewhere and give you a good view of their hands. 
we've actually had pretty good luck strapping a little li li real lightweight Logitech camera to their forehead. It looks ridiculous, um, <laughs> and you have to occasionally adjust it. Oh but, um, but we've actually had pretty good pretty good data collection yeah. with that, and you can get you can get because you, you can get a lot. You can pretty mm. much see what their fingers are doing. I take Again, it, they look very nerdy, but uh, <laughs> like a like a yeah. Uh, I take it you've seen the the device mounted cameras. I think they're just called phone sleds or similar. You can make one yourself for about fifteen quid or, or whatever. I've seen a piece of plastic in a toaster. Uh, I think you can just melt the plastic over the toaster. Google it. There's oh, really? instructions <laughs> online. Um, yeah, we've we've uh, for really annoying systems. I shouldn't say annoying for uh, for problematic systems like the 3ds that doesn't have a, a video output. Um, that's your uh, pretty much your only solution is to use some sort of on device mounted uh, camera. And it works okay. It's a bit intrusive, but what, else, what are you going to do? It's better than getting no data at all. Now we just we use PTZ cameras. We just mm -hmm. over the over the shoulder. We just set a safe zone for them. Um, we're fortunate. So, for example, like with the Vita, <coughs> we had back touch. So when we're looking for hand positions, we they were actually in the dev tools. They're built in the the capture. Nice. And so we just take the, the the data stream of the touch points and then and then tie them to the video. And we know what people are doing. So that was tools, really, for us. I think there's another question out here. Have you tried Google Glass as a way to capture mobile? <laughs> so it's a, is, is Shane in this room? No. <laughs> Darn. Uh, we have a grad student who's actually worked really extensively with Google Glass. Um, and that's something we have looked at. Um, I think it's something he is, is still looking at. Mm -hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, he's not here. So mm. if you want, grab me afterwards, and I'll get you in touch with him. Yeah. And he can get you some if you're going to go Google Glass, you ought to be looking at least at some of the vendors provide uh, eye tracking glasses. I think Toby, you've got an eye tracking glasses mm. solution, right? If you're going to buy glass, go whole hog and get eye tracking in there as well. Uh, you know, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the glasses from Toby, will, that you wear them, and they, they do eye tracking as well. So that they have a video feed like Google Glass, and it will do eye tracking overlay on top of video. They're super smart, but they're deadly expensive. Yeah, they're, they're great They're great product, but they're like 20 grand a pop. Yeah, it's, it's, so. they're so very expensive. Yeah. But, but super cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. Don't rub it in. <laughs> yeah, so those are, those are, th there are tools that will do that. Um, that, that I don't know if Google Glass is one of them, but I can put you in contact mm. with Shane. You can talk to you about it. Mm. I think it's a super exciting idea, though, for sure. Yeah, it's a great idea. Other questions? Yeah, I see at the back. I had a, a suggestion. I had pretty good luck with a uh, digital overhead projector. You know, the thing that you might oh, yeah. have to put in class. Mm -hmm. so sometimes they're around. Um, you just put the uh, you know, main person holds their device underneath that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a pretty good job picking up other things. Uh, so that's yeah. articulated yeah. lamps. Mm -hmm. as well. You can just cut them off. Mm -hmm. And um, we've got a couple that a guy built for us at Amazon. And then you just mount a camera, a webcam on top of that lamp, and then you can move it around as much as you want. That's really ingenious. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so just ob taking notes, observational notes? Yeah. Like Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of time stamps, like using a macro at work, and then some iPad apps that uh -huh. you could, you know, grab ping. And you can do uh, macros on Excel yeah. that work pretty well for that. We have actually done, used it. We used a Google chat, which has the advantage that we can actually, so we'll have everybody who's monitoring on the same thing. And then we had a case where somebody, uh, somebody came in uh, and had a very slight accent but spoke beautiful English. And five minutes into the study, his cognitive load went up, and it was all rapid fire Spanish from that on out. And, uh, but fortunately, we had our, our resident Venezuelan in, uh, in, the, in the back <laughs> of the room. He, we were able to put it over the loudspeaker, and he was able to do real-time translation using Google Chat. So mm -hmm. our facilitator, so poor D, could figure out what was going on in the study while this guy was, you know, was, 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 was going at it. And, uh, so it was neat, because you know, at some point, he, he, Ed was, or, um, D was able to actually ask him questions, as Ed's typing it out for him. Like, oh, he's saying this. Ask him about this. And so. There was some that so so it has some advantages because it's all real time and multiple people can use it simultaneously. But those are great solutions too, I think. Are we using Google uh, Sheets, Google Sheets, uh, which you can build in timestamping automatic as well. So as soon as you enter a cell, it puts a timestamp in. So uh, so not only is that cloud based and online and, and backed up and all and cool, but it's also collaborative. So it allows us to have two columns with two researchers taking notes at the same time. I can see what uh, Ben's typing or, or one of my colleagues or whatever. Um, super efficient and yeah, we, we we really like that solution. Working collaboratively to take notes like that is just game changing. Uh, I personally like uh, using uh, it's kind of mind mapping software, or, or it's like a, 
a tree-based software where you can put issues in and then you know tab across to the next and put some descriptions and things. Uh, but yeah, collaborative breaks everything. As soon as you get, get collaborative, you can't go back or anything. Uh, that's, it's definitely the future. Feels great. That is a great question. Do you guys have thoughts on that? Oh my goodness. Uh, how, how wide? This size. The, bring it out in the center. Yeah. Around, around, the, edges. The, around the edges. And, and then, then, then back to back. Square yeah. on the outside, square on the center. Yeah. Right now we just have um, four, four tables and four people at those, table, at those tables. So like co-op. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the four players across it. Yeah. And um, it takes up a lot of room. Mm -hmm. It also like maybe a clover shade. <laughs> Yeah, well, participant workflows can be a problem there, too, because, like, if someone has to get up, what's that going to do to the rest of the group? Mm -hmm. um, and if you have to bring somebody in, what's that going to do? I had a problem in my dissertation study where uh, a guy showed up for, one night for the study, and I had, I had, like, 10 stations set up in a big U, and this guy who smelled like vodka and death <laughs> walked <laughs> all the way around this thing and just, ate, I mean, ate everybody as he went by just sort of went, what was that? You know, and they were all facing the other direction. So I mean, you can have cases where, like, and the, just he had to get so close to them that there was no, and then I had to walk them all the way back to get them back out. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can have, yeah, it's sort of, sort of a random war story, but but it, like you want to make sure there's enough room that you can move people around without interfering with each other, um, because they'll kick chairs, they'll bump into each other, they'll smell bad. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes, and that's a, that can be an issue too. Or the contest I do Call of Duty zombie striking. Okay. okay. It's like wave -based. Going on while we're trying to isolate their experience. You're using desk dividers to divide, divide people up, right? Because it allows you to compact everything down if you, you know, allocate someone some space rather than letting them spread out. I mean, you've seen the labs here, they're, they're super compact if you actually look at how close they are, but they don't feel it once you get into that space. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, desk dividers are good. And nothing isolates participants from each other like headphones. Yeah. You put headphones on people, you cut off their hearing, and like mm -hmm. it's like the rest of the world goes away. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, even if they can still see it, a lot of times they won't look because you know so much of context is hearing. It's you know it's it's what people are doing around you, the noises they're making, and if you can't hear any of that, I mean, you could have you could have a, a marching band go by, you know, sort of at an angle in your visual field and not notice it. So like these cards that have been he's probably been holding up that I've been ignoring for the last couple. Of <laughs> Are we out of time, or we still have one, have minute? one minute? We have one minute. That's one quick question. Who's got one last quick question? Is there a general rule of thumb for how, uh, what the minimal width of a station should be versus like playing on a console? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just three feet is what we usually yeah. use. Yeah, meter. I think is what we're yeah. going for. Thirty-six three feet inches. Deck, yeah. Which is good. Yeah. yeah. Sounds about right. We have time for one more. One more. Quick, quick, quick. All right, Shane. Uh, someone had a question about glass. They could just approach me afterwards. I can answer the question. That's Shane. <laughs> when you speak his name, he appears. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the time.